good afternoon good afternoon doctors thank you very much for joining us today uh, for this webinar on hydrocephalus uh, this is deepak naik welcoming you on behalf of uh, health and you uh, health and you has a digital initiative known as digi neuro so digi neuro a digital initiative by health and you welcomes you all health and you therapeutics is a joint venture with new link company limited japan uh, we have a vision vision to fulfill unmet medical needs uh, for to launch innovative first time need products uh, we have launched anurite the first amitriptyline plus mycobalamin combination uh, anurite 5 mg anurite 10 mg anurite 25 mg for diabetic neuropathy and in migraine you have lot of flexibility here in uh, updating the dose uh, when migraine is not controlled by one drug we have anurite beta amitriptyline plus propionol mm -hmm. uh, anurite beta 520 year anurite beta 1040 year we have first pharmacological combination of amitriptyline plus pregabalin here pregabalin is given in a sustained release form to match pharmacokinetic profile of amitriptyline which is once a day so once a day and pregabalin made once a day uh, is a pharmacological combination to give your patient 24 hours pain relief uh, we are the only one who are importing mycobalamin injection from japan to give you the highest quality and 100% mycobalamin uh, when the patient gets it new right injection uh, very recently we launched the first uh, uh, 2.5 mg strength of clobazam to give you a lot of flexibility and control in epilepsy management in down titration up titration and in bid dosing aclobaz 2.5 5 and 10 in mouth dissolving tablet and very soon we are launching a very innovative vitamin therapy for migraine uh, uh, recommended by american academy of neurology which will contain riboflavin 200 mg magnesium 200 mg and coq10 10 mg so with your support with your advice we will launch many more new products first time in the country uh, today i have the privilege and uh, i am feeling very proud to uh, welcome and introduce dr dev pujari sir dr dev pujari sir uh, is the leading neurosurgeon of the country uh, he has done fellowship uh, in ngh newcastle england and henry ford hospital usa uh, sir uh, is a visiting faculty for many international universities like uh, uh, university of shinshu japan uh, emory university usa and also leading indian institutes of medical sciences like scpg lucknow and aims delhi Sir has also been a uh, uh, speaker in international symposium of world-renowned bodies like WFNS, uh, ASNS, ACNS, and World Endoscopy Congress. Uh, sir has published many books and have authored many chapters in textbook of neurosurgery. Sir is past president of NSI, ISPN, ASPN. Sir is currently a chairman of WFNS Neuroendoscopy and Neuroendocrine Committee. learning from sir is always a dream come true uh, today sir has put together a very very top of the class uh, top of the career uh, uh, specialist uh, dr deepu jari sir today will be uh, supported by lectures by dr suresh suresh sankhra sir dr nk venkatramana sir dr sandeep chatterjee sir dr n muthu kumar sir and dr darjeet singh sir we uh, on behalf of health and you welcome our speakers and today discussion panel will be held by dr v rajeshekhar and dr lokendra singh so on behalf of health and you i welcome you all and i have uh, now pleasure to hand over the session to dr deep pujari sir to carry it forward sir over to you can i share my screen uh, uh, dinesh yes sir you can thanks deepak uh, that was quite a, a long unnecessary uh, introduction i think for me but uh, i'm i'm very thankful to you for supporting this uh, actually we really have a galaxy of uh, uh, neurosurgeons from india today uh, to help us understand hydrocephalus better actually i must say that uh, last year we did a symposium on uh, pediatric hydrocephalus at the bombay hospital uh, somewhere it was uh, addressed by all the speakers who are here today and many others 
and which was very well attended. And uh, uh, I'm I'm thankful for all of them to uh, uh, be here. Uh, though the program was mainly sponsored uh, by Sun Pharma, uh, the Dr. Uh, Mr. Deepak also helped us quite considerably, and he actually wanted to webcast the whole conference at that time, which was not possible. But uh, today you, uh, we are taking it uh, to you who could not attend the last time's uh, program. So I will start off by uh, just introducing uh, that uh, hydrocephalus is something which all of us know very well. And the way we understood it is that there is increased CSF in the cerebral ventricles with some amount of ventriculomegaly. And if you want to uh, give a very short definition, I think that still fits in the best. Dandy and Blackfan almost 100 years ago uh, talked about communicating versus non-communicating hydrocephalus and then Ransoff talked about the fact that all ventricular, uh, all hydrocephalus are probably obstructive but they may be intraventricular obstructive or extraventricular obstructive. And there have been several attempts at uh, classification of hydrocephalus since then which depended on uh, which compartment is having more CSF what is the etiology, and uh, all these uh, did not go very well. And the, I think the recently most common classification or the definition and classification, which is acceptable uh, to most people is what was supposed uh, proposed by Harold Rickett in 2009, where he said that there is an active distension of the ventricular system of the brain resulting from inadequate passage of cerebrospinal fluid from its point of production within the cerebral ventricles to its point of absorption into the systemic circulation. And I think this has helped in a large extent because it has excluded other abnormalities of CSF dynamics like the brain intra hypertension, the cerebral ventricular uh, hypertrophy due to brain atrophy itself, uh, like uh, ex vacuo ventricular dilatation. And uh, uh, it, it does not specify the source of production or absorption of CSF and therefore does not presuppose the mechanism. And uh, then he has actually uh, talked about the classification system, which is based on where, uh, what is the pathology or what is the site of obstruction, which is uh, again, <clears throat> not we are going to follow. Today we are going to follow the flow of uh, the etiological classification today and uh, the recordings of that meeting have been quite useful for us in producing this. And I thank again, Mr. Deepak for that. And this book will soon be available to the members of the NDSPN and it is also available on Amazon. Uh, uh, so I, I would like therefore uh, to start the proceedings for the day. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Suresh Sankhla. Uh, he is the chief neurosurgeon at the global hospital. Uh, nowadays it is, it has, uh, uh, got another name. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the new name global, of the hospital. Global Glen Eagle. Glen Eagles, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he will be followed by Dr. Venkat Ramana, who's going to talk to us about hydrocephalus associated with spina bifida. Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee from Park Clinic and Wims uh, from Calcutta, mm -hmm. who's going to talk to us about post-infective hydrocephalus. Dr. Muthu Kumar from Madurai, who's going to talk to us about tumoral hydrocephalus. And Dr. Daljit Singh is going to talk to us about the relevance of endoscopy in, endo in uh, the management. And the session will be coordinated uh, and regulated. And uh, uh, then the panel discussion will happen with uh, our two esteemed uh, uh, discussion panel uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Lokendra Singh, who's currently the president of the Neurological Society of India and is the chief neurosurgeon and director of SIMS in uh, Nagpur and Professor V. Rajshekhar, uh, who's a senior professor at Bellore. So over to you, Dr. Sakla. Thank you, Dr. Dev Pujari, for uh, arranging such a nice uh, symposium on pediatric hydrocephalus today. Uh, and I'm very happy that we, I can see so many good prominent speakers on this subject present here. Can you see my presentation? 
Yeah. Yes. Can you see? Yes. All right. Uh, 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 can somebody just inform me at the end of 10 or 11 minutes? I will, if I will do that. Have to no, wrap up. Yeah, please. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank, you yeah. Thank you. So uh, the the pre-empty is, is a very major problem all over the world. And as you can uh, see, it can cause so many problems with the uh, newborn, uh, including intraventricular hemorrhage, which can lead into the post uh, hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and all together they can have so many neurological problems including uh, neurodevelopmental impairment <laughs> of, in about 85 percent of these kids uh, which had a very very bad effect on their uh, overall life uh, so a prematurity is uh, very important uh, and it is always associated with some sort of uh, uh, birth weight uh, problem and whenever it is associated with very low birth weight that is less than 1500 gram the chances of that infant developing intraventricular hemorrhage and subsequently the post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus are very high if you look at the literature you will find that the rate of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage uh, in premature kids with low birth weight is as high as 50 percent uh, and it usually happens in one to two hours after the the birth and lasts up to the, the risk lasts up to the first week after the birth. Similarly, the risk of uh, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus varies from 20% to 74%, uh, and about 38% uh, to 92% of these kids eventually require a surgical processes, process for permanent CSF diversion. Uh, if you look at the ba uh, basic pathophysiology of IVH, you will find that it is usually because of the germinal matrix which bleeds. The germinal matrix is usually located in the subependymal region at the head of caudate area at the level of foramen monroe. Uh, and it contains immature vasculature, which is very prone to bleed. And also, in addition to that, it has very poorly developed autoregulation. Both of these factors are really predisposing factors for the intraventricular hemorrhage. So once this happens, you can either have hemorrhagic infarction of the brain or you can have uh, intracranial hemorrhage uh, or you can have both. And whenever this happens, you can eventually go through all these uh, uh, biochemical changes which eventually lead to the intraventricular hemorrhage. The post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus is actually uh, because mainly of the blood breakdown products and the cellular debris present in the intraventricular as well as in the basal system, which can, can cause uh, arachnoiditis or fibrous reaction and granular epinematis, adhesive arachnoiditis, and scarring mainly at the basal CSF systems as well as the arachnoid uh, villus level and intraventricular. So all of them combined, uh, they can produce hydrocephalus. So this is the, the, the hydrocephalus in these patients. Whenever there is intraventricular hemorrhage, you can have intraventricular obstruction of the hydrocephalus, uh, causing hydrocephalus. You can have extraventricular uh, obstruction causing hydrocephalus. And you can have an impaired CSF absorption at the arachnoid villus level, which can also lead to the post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Uh, the severity of the hydrocephalus can be graded and it has been, the grading has been uh, done by so many authors. The classification is the one that has been accepted very widely. It is based on the CT scan findings. Uh, it is basically a uh, subependipal hemorrhage is called grade one. The intraventricular hemorrhage without dilatation is grade two. And the last two, three and grade four are purely intraventricular hemorrhages. The other classification is based on the ultrasonography, uh, but basically it has got the same uh, classes and gradings. And grade three and grade four are the severe type of uh, intraventricular hemorrhages as with the post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. As far as the clinical presentation is concerned, uh, there is a varied presentation in these infants. Uh, many of these infants are asymptomatic. Some of them have a very catastrophic course of this disease. Uh, which lead to acute and rapid deterioration in the neurological status. Uh, while some of them, they have a very solitary course and the deterioration or the development of the neurological deficit is uh, stepwise uh, and it continuously progressing. 
the uh, uh, neurological assessment is very, very important because some of the signs are purely because of the intraventricular hemorrhage only, such as the decreased level of arousal, motor asymmetry, hypotonia, and so on. However, when the hydrocephalus is developed, you can see the frank signs of uh, raised intracranial pressure in these kids. So it is initially, it's very difficult to differentiate between the uh, IVH, uh, pure IVH, and uh, the IVH plus progressive hydrocephalus. Ultrasonography is very important and very, very uh, uh, diagnostic in these patients. It has got certain advantages, including, you know, there is no ionizing radiation as compared to the CT scan, can be performed at bedside, uh, it can be repeated clearly, very frequently, adequate visualization, not only the vent uh, ventricular hemorrhage, but also the ventricular size and periventricular leukemia, edema, ischemia, all these things can be easily detected on the ultrasonography. So this is the ultrasonography of one of these events showing the hemorrhage at the quadrate PPS region. It is just partly intraventricular, so we would call it a grade two type of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. While in this picture, the intraventricular hemorrhage is uh, quite massive and it is causing obstruction at the foramen monroe yeah. and acute hydrocephalus of the hydrocephalus. This would be classified as grade three or grade four of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. MRI is definitely the method of choice and whenever it is possible, it, it should be performed because it gives not only the hemorrhage, it gives many other informations which are required for surgical treatment as well as the, the prognosis of these, these children. CT scan, because of the risk of radiation uh, exposure, are uh, usually avoided in these patients. Uh, as far as the treatment is concerned, there, has been, uh, sev there have been several uh, uh, suggestions about the medical management, particularly very popular is the furosemide and the acetylamide use. But if you see the long, uh, large series, you will find that there is no actual beneficial effect on the overall outcome of these with the uh, medical treatment. Similarly, intraventricular fibrinolysis using TPA has been tried and tried uh, in larger uh, trials and all that, but uh, it has really failed to show any, any significant outcome. And uh, also it has got its own side effects. So there was a trial which is called DRIFT trial and performed in 2007 where uh, the low dose RTPA was uh, was injected in a series of patients. About 77th infants were studied. So this is the uh, TPA which is injected into the ventricle, in, infused diffusely, and uniform rate, and then the same amount of CS was removed from the contralateral ventricle. The unfortunate part of this trial is that there was a huge, a large. Uh, uh, a mortality uh, rate during the surgery and the intraventricular hemorrhage during the during the uh, study was as high as 34 percent. In fact, this trial had to be suspended because of these problems. Uh, but those kids who have survived longer than two years, these are the very the very uh, particular group of the patients which were followed for a few years, and uh, it was found that these kids have a reduced risk of severe cognitive disability and the lower long-term death or the severe disability in these kids. So there is a certain group uh, or subgroup of the patient which can be benefited by this uh, uh, method of treatment. When to treat hydrocephalus is very important. Uh, and then there are several uh, controversies in the surgical decision makings and one has to be very, very careful. The fact that the, there is some evidence of a spontaneous resolution of IVH, which is seen in about 10 to 35% of the patients. These are the patients, they may not develop hydrocephalus and may not require a patient or any kind of CSF diversion. Similarly, about 32% of the patients uh, do develop hydrocephalus, but their hydrocephalus is arrested at some point. And in fact, the spontaneous regression is also common in these patients. So these patients may also not require a surgical uh, treatment. Uh, most of these patients, when they deteriorate, you know, when they present, you know, they are usually unstable for any surgical procedure, particularly those who have very low birth weight at the time of uh, birth. Uh, also, the CSF is heavily stained with or mixed with blood, debris and proteins, or clearly unsuitable for any kind of uh, ventricular procedures. In addition to that, many of these kids also have sepsis, general sepsis, pulmonary difficulties, 
and hemodynamic uh, instability. So are, they are not clearly uh, suitable for the surgical intervention. Surgical intervention patients are only those who uh, whose hydrocephalus is progressively dilating or worsening, and there is a clear cut clinical worsening seen on the repeated clinical examination. Their weight is more than 1500 gram. The CS of viscosity is almost normal. Oh, two minutes already. Two minutes. Okay. So, uh, the uh, when there is a clear cut ventricular megaly and the progressive enlargement of the ventricle, uh, the CSF along with the raised intracranial uh, uh, signs and symptoms, these are the kids who are a clear uh, candidates for surgical uh, intervention. Uh, there are uh, temporary methods in as well as the permanent methods. So there are temporizing procedures, including serial lumbar punctures, repeated ventricular tapping, ventricular reservoir tapping, external ventricular drains, ventricular subgallial shunts, and the neuroendoscopic lavage. And the permanent CSF diversions include ventricular peritoneal shunts or endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So I will quickly go over each of these. The lumbar puncture, we all know, it has not really helped very well uh, to, to most of these uh, kids and eventually they require uh, VP shunt. Similarly, the percutaneous ventricular tapping is also not very helpful and about 90% of these patients require VP shunts. Uh, one good uh, uh, method of treating them is through the ventricular access device. Uh, but again, there are limitations and the shunt uh, requirement is about 70%. Uh, it can be used in many cases. External ventricular drain can be used in many cases. The, the advantage is that it can keep the intraventricular uh, pressure constant because the continuous drainage of the CSF, but it has also got its own uh, disadvantages and the shunt uh, requirement is very high. Ventricular subgallial shunt, we are all aware of of uh, subgallial pocket has been made uh, and the ventricular CSF is drained into the subgallial pockets. And this can be used uh, very successfully as a temporizing method. Uh, the neuroendoscopic lavage is the recent and new technique which has been uh, uh, advocated recently. It actually uh, is the endoscopic uh, evacuation or intraventricular hemorrhage as well as the washing, brain wash. Uh, and the first uh, report was uh, published in 2014 by, from the Berlin uh, group uh, and it was a uh, very successful results and I won't go into the details. This is the uh, one patient of ours who has undergone this procedure. So advantages of neuroendoscopic lavage, uh, significant reduction in the ventricular size, uh, number of punctures are required less and the overall shunt requirement rate is reduced by 58% from 80 percent. So it is a very useful method. When you compare this method, results of this method with the other conventional method, the rate of multiloculated hydrocephalus is reduced to 8.6 as compared to the other methods. Shunt dependency is 68 uh, percent. CSF infection is reduced to 4.3 percent. Similarly, when you compare with the EVD only, you will find that the shunt free is about 30 percent. Meningitis in reduced to 8.5%, long term Rish, shunt infection is 17%. Okay, Sorry, this is last one or two. Up, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, last one you. or two, two slides. You. Okay. And the loculated hydrocephalus is also reduced significantly. Uh, as far as the permanent uh, procedures are concerned, we, we have the VP shunt, which we all are aware of. The only problem is that shunt infection, particularly in this group, is, is very high. Uh, then the EVD. So the EVD uh, success rate is 38% as compared to the hydrocephalus of different type. So it is much, much less. Uh, what is more important is the degree of scaring in the prepontine system, which determines whether this candidate is fit for uh, ETV or not. And the, the, this is the overall outcome, uh, which we are all know about this. What is most important is the pre-maturity and the severity of, of hemorrhage are the most important thing. So in conclusion, I would like to say that the likelihood of progressive hydrocephalus after IVH increases with the grade of hemorrhage. Severity, more severe and more poor prognosis. Early and aggressive intervention in the premature infant may decrease the need for a VP shunt and improve the neurological outcomes. Shunt malfunctions and low ETV success rates are very, very common with these uh, subgroup of the patient. 
uh, of uh, post uh, hydro post hydro sickness and we need to do a lot of uh, research and uh, go through very various biochemical markers as well as uh, the newer uh, mr techniques to really you know work on these things to find more and more and identify uh, better candidates for uh, this surgical procedures and i thank you very much for uh, kind and patience listening thank you Hello. Thank you, Suresh. Okay. Can we go on to the next talk, please? Yeah. Uh, is there any scope for discussion here, or we'll do it? Lokendra, I, th I think it's right at the end. This is what Shaker told me. He okay. said that we'll have uh, half an hour at the end. Sure. Okay. Okay. So now, so, I think Dr. Venkat Ramana will. Yeah. We are answering some questions in the chat. Uh, but I think some direct questions we'll take uh, uh, at the end. Okay. Uh, can you uh, stop sharing? I have. Angela? I have. Yeah, I have done that actually. Okay. No, well, now it's going. Yeah. Can you see the slide now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Dev Pujari, for uh, uh, organizing this webinar as well as bringing out this book. Uh, treatment of hydrocephalus and spina bifida is a different ball game altogether. Spina bifida is the most common congenital anomaly of the CNS, which is compatible with the life. There are many definitions uh, and classification based upon the anatomical as the open and closed, whereas the embryological classification, which is becoming more important now, uh, the defect arises either from the uh, different stages of embryological development. <clears throat> However, the incidence which has been described in, in the literature is varies uh, very widely from country to country the highest incidence being in the South Africa and Nigeria. And the rest of the countries is gradually coming down because of the introduction of the folate, as well as the prenatal screening that is happening across most of the developing countries. And the, the present average uh, incidence is about three to uh, eight uh, live birth, uh, th per thousand live births across in the uh, best of the countries. Now, the hydrocephalus incidence uh, is very important in uh, spina bifida, uh, particularly in the open type of spina bifida, whereas the spina bifida occulta has a very a small incidence of hydrocephalus, which is uh, not very significant. Now, majority of these open myelomelangoceles present at birth with 10% of them with the significant hydrocephalus, whereas 85% of them manifest in the first week of the life. Now, the, according to the literature, the highest as much of 90% of them have been associated with the Arnold Kyrie malformation, which has also been proposed as one of the causes for the hydrocephalus. Now, the etiology or pathogenesis of the hydrocephalus in spina bifida uh, is very complex and varies from individual condition to condition and the degree and the extent of the severity of the anomaly. Now, the commonest is the aqueductal stenosis. There are several theories which have been proposed as a, a primary anomaly, as a secondary anomaly, as the defect in the brainstem, neurulation, which leading to narrow aqueduct. <laughs> and Kyrie malformation has been proposed as the commonest cause where there has been uh, a herniation of the structures that will result in the CSF obstruction. Uh, vertical translocation of the brainstem causing increased resistance to CSF flow through the tentorial hiatus is another mechanism that has been proposed. Small volume of the posterior fossa itself uh, proposes the hindrance for the CSF uh, flow. Abnormal tilt of the tentorium and the cerebellar prolapse leading to increased resistance of the venous flow in the sigmoid sinus also can cause the venous hypertension. So these are the several theories which have been proposed for the onset and progression of the hydrocephalus in the open spina bifida. Now, in addition to that, the hydrocephalus in spina bifida is complicated, unlike the other simple hydrocephalus, by the presence of several ventricular anomalies. 
Now, invariably, the small fourth ventricle, because of the compressed posterior fossa or aqueductal stenosis, uh, the aqueduct is barely visible. And uh, there is a narrow angle, uh, angled appearance of the third ventricle, which has been described as the shark tooth deformity of the third ventricle. The deformities of the lateral ventricles varies uh, quite significantly from being normal to a quite a, a variable degree of deformities. The defects in the septum and the corpus callosum of them are the quite significant. And in addition to that, there can be a gyral as well as a beaking of the tectum. And quite often, uh, the uh, hydrocephalus in spina bifida is uh, predominantly with the dilatation of the occipital horns, known as the colpocephaly. In addition to that, they also can have cortical abnormalities, which can result into a variety of neuronal dysfunction, which we'll talk about later. Now, the impact of the hydrocephalus in uh, spina bifida is uh, there is a progressive enlargement of the head, there's a progressive increase in the intracranial pressure, progressive neurological deterioration, progressive intellectual deterioration, and invariably, some of them lead to failure to thrive. And the, the rapidity of the hydrocephalus depends upon how fast they can have this failure to thrive syndrome. Now, among the diagnosis, neurosonography is the simplest, which is very good in diagnosing as well as monitoring the progression of the hydrocephalus in these children. Uh, one of the greatest advantages of spina bifida is that since there is a lesion on the back, these children are quite often followed up comparatively better than to the congenital hydrocephalus, where they come only at later stages when the head becomes obviously large. And there is an opportunity where these children can be monitored with this neurosonography and take an appropriate decision. And MRI is the safest investigation for the entire uh, brain as well as the spine to look at the various anomalies, ventricular abnormalities. In addition to that, the parenchymal abnormalities, which are significant in these children, can be identified very easily. CT scan, of course, need to be done sometimes when there is a bony anomaly associated with the uh, uh, parenchymal abnormalities. Now, the goals of management in hydrocephalus is essentially to control the intracranial pressure, facilitate the normal growth of the brain, to reduce the complications of the hydrocephalus, like ependymal rupture, periventricular seepage, parenchymal damage, thinning of the cortical mantle, uh, uh, infections, etc. Preserving the integrity of the neuronal function is the major goal and promoting thereby the intellectual development. Now, when you come to the management of hydrocephalus, the indication of uh, treatment is any hydrocephalus that is progressive uh, is an indication and deserves treatment in all these uh, children. Now, the treatment of this hydrocephalus in spina bifida can be now divided into two groups, a prenatal hydrocephalus, which has been diagnosed in uh, during the pregnancy. How do we deal with that? And then the second one is the postnatal hydrocephalus, which can vary right from the day of birth all the way up to the childhood. Now, the prenatal hydrocephalus uh, can be diagnosed with ultrasound by the classical description is atrial diameter more than 10 millimeter is diagnostic. Ventriculoamniotic amniotic shunts have been proposed quite a long time ago. However, uh, a long-term uh, analysis of these ventricular amniotic shunts have only 43% uh, uh, can survive without any handicap. 7% had mild handicap overall the review of the literature, whereas 50% of them still have severe handicap despite being treated. Now, it's not a very simple procedure, has been associated with the risks like infection, slippage of the tubes, complications to the mother, abortions, uh, etc. However, with the time, the, the technology has improved that there has now been a percutaneously, these shunts can be placed under MRI guidance. And there has to be an, uh, an anchoring mechanism which is now developed very well so that the tube slippage has become the least of the complications. That the tubes presently available are kink resistant. And the one way valve, uh, uh, which is very much useful to prevent reverse flow and uh, Developing uh, development of ventriculitis, which is completely avoided. However, the important point parallelly with the development of the fetal surgery, uh, many uh, centers, especially Philadelphia group, have reported that prenatal repair of minor malignancy have reduced the incidence of requirement of ventricular peritoneal shunts postnatally to 42.6%. I think this is a very significant point to note. However, the ventricular amniotic shunts cannot be done indiscriminately because there is an associated risk of 30% of complications which need to be counseled very well uh, to the mothers and the family. And uh, therefore, there will be stringent criteria to identify who are the ideal candidates for the ventricular amniotations. We MRI of the uh, pregnant mother is very important to evaluate the complete anomalies that are associated with that. And the indications generally for the ventricular amniotic shunts are the, it has to be a singleton pregnancy, 
normal fetal carrier tap, amniotic fluid without any infection, absence of associated anomalies proved by MRI repeatedly uh, with the proper expertise, and progressive ventricular dilatation, gestational age of less than 32 weeks, and of course with the fetal lung maturity. And this is the complex procedure and not being practiced all over the world. Very few centers are uh, doing that. Now, when the question is that post datal hydrocephalus, which is uh, all of us have been familiar with that, and uh, we have uh, options here. The commonest option in all these is about ventricular peritoneal shunt. And uh, 80 to 85 percent of the children with myelomeningocele require a ventricular peritoneal shunt uh, at different stages of their life, most of them in the first uh, one month of the life. Now, the reported success have been 80 to 90 percent. However, the revision rate is also 45 percent within the first year. That's the average uh, literature review as on 2020. Sorry, it's uh, to, uh, 2012. It's 2020 review also says the same percentage. Now, the success rates is about 80 to 90 percent. Shunt dependency is about 50 percent. Now, when it comes to the uh, ventricular peritoneal shunts, we have three options. Uh, first, do a shunt, reduce the intracranial pressure. That will also reduce the pressure on the myelomeningocele. Then go ahead and do the repair. Uh, the other option, if there is a leaking uh, CSF, first do the re repair and look at the uh, follow the ventricular uh, size and then put a shunt. And some centers do the simultaneous shunt as well as the repair. And I believe the simultaneous uh, shunt as well as the repair has distinct advantages. And a single advantage, a single anesthesia, we can uh, do the, both the procedures. The ventricular pressure is reduced. The wound healing is better. And with the one hospital stay, the kid gets the treatment for the, both the conditions. Now, however, these three options are open to the individual surgeons, uh, clinical condition, and various factors uh, to take a decision, a tailor-made decision, depending upon the individual merits of the case. Now, the other option we have in these children is the uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is uh, becoming prominent in the recent years. Uh, however, it has got its own uh, problems. Uh, the primary thing that we have is that the success rates is only about uh, 30 to 40 percent. Uh, now, the ETV can be done as a primary procedure. That means Winker, uh, two minutes. Yeah, without a shunt, you do an ETV. Secondary is that we do a ventricular peritoneal shunt. And uh, later on, when the child grows and comes back with the shunt complication, you remove the shunt and replace that with the ETV, which has got about 50 to 70 percent success rate. Third, parotid plexus coagulation, WAF, Benjamin WAF has been uh, uh, propagating that. It has got an additional 30 percent improvement in the clinical outcome, but it's still controversial. We, however, abnormal ventricle anatomy, thick floor of the third ventricle, absent septum pellucidum can be a complication, can be a uh, quite difficult thing to do a ETV in these children. It can lead a deterioration to the surgeons. And the poor results are often because of the open sutures, poorly developed subarachnoid spaces, and immature arachnoidal villi that can cause uh, failure of this ETV in the initial stages. Now, however, we patient has got its own share of complications, uh, It could be mechanical, infective, and over drainage. And 45% of them require a, a shunt revision. That's the major problem. And uh, ETV has a set technical as well as functional failure, which is very well known. Uh, the most important goal is that to get the good psychological outcome in these kid, kids. And overall, neuropsychological outcome is less in comparison to the pure hydrocephalus, primarily because of the physical disability which is associated. Uh, it interferes with the mobility of these children. Developmental neurological abnormalities, uh, which can also influence the psychological intellectual outcome. And overall, the factors that influence the outcome, it depends upon the timing of the shunt, the effective functioning of the shunt, rate of the complications that the kid has to undergo, the number of revisions, infections, et cetera, age of the treatment, and the inherent uh, neurological structural abnormalities that are present in an individual child. Overall, hydrocephalus is uh, always associated with uh, open spina bifida. Uh, early diagnosis and intervention will protect the brain and allow the neurological uh, normal development. And Prenatal shunts are useful, especially in the select patients, provided you have the infrastructure and the expertise. And prenatal repair of open defects seems to be uh, hopeful and beneficial in the years to come. Postnatal hydrocephalus certainly needs treatment whenever there is a progression. And choice of procedure depends upon the individual merits. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Venkat, for finishing on the dot. Thank you. So I now invite the next speaker. Is that Sandeep? Sandeep, you are to unmute, unmute yourself. Ah, yeah, OK. Oh, great.
Okay, are you able to see my screen? No, not, yet. not yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Great. Great. Stop the stopwatch. I'm so thank you for asking me, uh, Shekhar, to speak on post infective hydrocephalus. I, I thought I'll uh, term my talk post infective hydrocephalus lessons we've learned the hard way because this is something that I'm still uh, grappling with at the present time how to deal with kids that have hydrocephalus caused by various infections. And it's a little bit like the Red Queen's race in Alice in Wonderland, where, you know, uh, Alice is um, running with the queen and however fast she runs, the queen is still running. And she tells the queen, uh, I can't run because however fast I run, you're still running in front of me. And the queen turns around and says, and this is the words I really like from um, Lewis Carroll's book. It says here, we run as fast as we can just to stay in one place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast. So we need to run twice as fast to be able to make any progress in post-infective hydrocephalus. When I came back to this country uh, too long ago to remember the date, uh, I found that the incidence of infections and in shunts of infants that we were shunting was immensely high. So we decided to try and check what their CSF was like. And we published this years ago when we took 150 infants and we tested their CSF. These were infants that had come to us as aqueductal stenosis based on their radiology. But when we decided to test their CSF, we found to our surprise, at least those that were above one month of age, almost half of them had in fact evidence of infection in the CSF. So they'd had an episode of, uh, of sepsis in their uh, immediate postnatal life, which had not been detected. They ended up with uh, hydrocephalus, which masqueraded as aqueductal stenosis, but in fact was really post-infected. And then, of course, just at the same time uh, from Uganda, Ben Warf published this paper, which showed that the predominance of uh, hydrocephalus in Uganda was caused by infective origin. In fact, in our own series, we found that infants in infants, less than 40% of the hydrocephalus was due to true aqueductal stenosis in our part of the world. So what does one do when one has infection and hydrocephalus existing together? Here are the four options, an external ventricular drain, an ETV, putting in a ventricular access device, or doing a ventricular subgalial shunt. What about an external ventricular drain? This was definitely the most popular thing when I started doing these procedures. The problem, of course, is there is an infection, and you're putting in an external ventricular drain, which, to my mind, is reinfecting an infective CSF. And it seems illogical, particularly in children, where you put in an external ventricular drain, and the mum turns the child around and then the EVD comes out and is dangling on the bed when you come on the morning round. The EVD somehow are things, apart from the mechanical issues and the infection, were things that we decided long ago was not very suitable to our practice. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy, you've heard, was, uh, was in fact fashionable when we started doing this. And every patient, we tried to do an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Here's a child with post-meningitic hydrocephalus, you can see how turbid the CSF is. And it's quite a challenge to actually be able to see the floor of the third ventricle. If you can, like in this patient, everything is in a mess. And you can see this is an, the, the third ventricle ostomy that I've performed, but there's, there's exudates everywhere. And as you go in, there's exudates even around the basilar artery. And just looking at this today makes shens shivers down my spine. I don't know how I I must have been very brave to be able to have done it. And then we looked at these ETVs that we'd done, and we found that three months, almost all of them were closed. So we decided that ETV wasn't a good idea. We continued to try to do them, and this is some examples of post-infective hydrocephalus where we were brave enough. I say brave, but as you can see the title on the slide, it, it suggests that another adjective should have been used. Here's the exit date on the basilar artery. Here's a thick 
uh, at the floor of the third ventricle that we're having a struggle to try and make a hole into. And then, of course, with these post-infective hydrocephalus, we had a lot of near misses, a lot of bleeding, a lot of unnecessary trauma to very, very friable tissue. And we thought and we realized that ETV failure was not only very high in infants below six months of age, if you tried to do ETV in post-infective hydrocephalus, it was also technically challenging. But at the same time, you see, you need to make sure that the CSF drainage is to be instituted before you can deal with the infection. When we looked at our own success rate of doing ETVs in post-infective, that is pyogenic and post-tuberculous hydrocephalus, you can see that they were appallingly poor. What about ventricular access device? These were not very popular because, you know, with a ventricular access device, you need to get imaging to find out whether the, the ventricular size is increasing or not, particularly if you have a child whose fontanelles are fused. And therefore, repeated imaging is necessary if you put in a ventricular access device, apart from, of course, the usual problems of infection. And when we decided to review our entire series of post-infective hydrocephalus in this review article we published in Child's Nervous System about a decade ago, this is what we proposed, and this is what we would still use today, the ventricular subgalial shunt. Remember our children, these infants are very malnourished. They are very low birth weight. They cannot tolerate a ventricular peritoneal shunt. In the midst of infection, you don't even want to do that. This ventricular subgalial shunt takes about seven minutes to do. It can very easily be done with a very quick anesthetic. And of course, the only modification that we made to the existing procedure is we used a low pressure shunt instead of just a tube. And the reason we did this was we found if we just used a tube, then there was collection of CSF and the ventricular, the subgalial pocket filled up very fast and often there was leakage of CSF. Whereas with a low pressure valve there, there was controlled drainage. It also gave you an opportunity to aspirate this valve from time to time percutaneously through here, and you could test whether the CSF was becoming sterile. And of course, everybody knows how to do this procedure. The advantage, of course, was avoiding a prolonged DVD, not putting in a shunt in a child whose peritoneal absorption was doubtful. You didn't have poor encephalic cysts caused by repeated tax. It was a useful temporizing measure, and you didn't have a reservoir to aspirate. And when we looked at our first 75 chip infants that we did this, we found initially, in, in, very interestingly, that the, this sort of a procedure, you know, to change ventricles of this size and shape into this size and shape by this ventricular subgalial shunt. Of course, we used antibiotics, but interestingly enough, this is what we used to do. We used to wait for the CSF to be sterile. We would then take the child and see if the ETV could be done. If ETV could not be done, we would do a VP shunt. If the ETV worked, then we would remove the VSG shunt. And today what we do with these children with VSG shunts is that we percutaneously put a stitch around the VSG shunts under sedation. We wait for 72 hours. If they don't develop hydrocephalus, we take them to the operating theater, give them an anesthetic and take it out. And this is an example of a of a small baby with a post-infective hydrocephalus. This is after the subgalial shunt. Then we went back and did an ETV, and this is the ultimate result. No shunts, and you can get rid of, of the, of the uh, VSG shunt. And even with a situation like this, which is a neuro pediatric neurosurgeon's nightmare, you can still put an endoscope, break the loculi, leave a VSG shunt, where you put the shunt into one of the big uh, loculi, and then you can end up, and this is, then we go back again uh, a second time after the infection is controlled. It's a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, everything uh, seems to be loculated and horrible, but you end up with a situation like this, which is, which is about really the best you can achieve in, in this situation. And here's another child. Of course, there are problems. We've had a few children that have developed infection over the subgalial pocket, and we've just revised the VSG shunt. But the most important thing is with these post-infective hydrocephalus, in our own series, we have avoided shunts in 58 out of the first 75 children with post-infective hydrocephalus that we've done a VSG shunt in. What about TB? Well, 
Post-tuberculous hydrocephalus is a different ballgame. Here is a child we're doing an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, and you see the tuberculomas in the floor of the third ventricle. The floor is thick. It's not very easy to do this procedure. And of course, the issue about, about tuberculosis, as we learned, of course, is that it is technically challenging. You may have a number of membranes, but you have to go through all of them uh, to make sure that you got an ETB that works. Of course, the problem with TB, as we know, is progressive arachnoiditis. There are a lot of confounding factors, the most important of which is that some children get ventricular dilatation due to ischemic softening of the brain. And of course, the ventricular megaly does not necessarily equate to a rise in ICP. And you can have one hydrocephalus, which is like an ex vacuo dilatation because of brain softening and one which is caused by raised ICP. Of course, you can do monitoring, you can do serial CT scanning, but a lot of things cause deterioration in tuberculosis, not necessarily ventricular megaly. And of course, we felt that CSF diversion helps if you have a good PALU grading. And of course, if, if you've done a temporary diversion, i.e. an EVD, and shown that the patient's clinical status improves. And of course, uh, we've written a lot about this. Professor Radshaker has written the seminal article on this uh, many years ago. And of course, uh, this is what we found. We found that uh, with post-tuberculous hydrocephalus, our success rate of ETV was 58%, which was almost about the same for doing a VP shunt. And I am not entirely certain as to which is better. In terms of uh, other infections, of course, very rarely neurocystic sarcosis causes ventricular megaly. Most of them do not require shunts. And, the and therefore, to conclude, oh, great. post meningitic hydrocephalus, we do a VSG shunt, we wait for the CSF to be sterile, and we try and do an ETV. For post tuberculous hydrocephalus, we do an early ETV provided we can prove that an ICP is raised. And we do not shunt only for ventricular megaly. We only shunt if the TB cannot be done or fails. And we have established that an EVD makes the child clinically better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you very much for this lucid presentation. And as we decided, we'll have discussion at the end of the, all the presentations. Now, may I now invite uh, Professor N. Muthu Kumar, and he will talk about tumoral hydroxyphalus. Muthu, please. Sandeep has to. OK. Uh, at the outset, let me thank Dr. Tumabjari for this opportunity. For this presentation, I will be discussing about the management of hydrocephalus in most of us are tumors in children. When we come to the incidence of uh, the importance of hydrocephalus in most of us are tumors, as shown by the study by Kulkani et al., among the two factors that negatively predict the quality of life in children with most of us are tumors, one is the presence of hydrocephalus. And the incidence of hydrocephalus at the time of presentation is much higher in children, it's somewhere around 70 to 90 percent. Whereas when you talk about post resection hydrocephalus, the incidence is somewhere around 30 percent. At this juncture, it is important to note that when we talk about post resection hydrocephalus, we are talking about a situation where there is a gross total tumor, a gross total excision of the tumor has been done, and the, and the CSF pathways have been re established. That is what we mean when we talk about post resection hydrocephalus. Now, what is the best management strategy for hydrocephalus at the time of initial presentation in children with post tuberculosis tumors? We have three or four options, BB shunt, EDVs, EVDs, and ventricle access devices. And uh, several studies more than 15, 50 years ago showed that uh, uh, preoperative uh, BB shunt significantly provided symptomatic improvement and it decreased the mortality and morbidity. And apart from that, studies have also shown that they decrease the post-operative CSF leak and pseudomeningos formation, but it comes with all the other disadvantages of shunts like infections, obstructions, and as shown by one study, shunt infection in children with post tumor are in independently correlated with mortality. And in a small proportion of children, as shown by this Egyptian study, about 3% of children, they can deteriorate because of upward herniation, especially if the children have large post tumors, and the intratemporal hemorrhage will occur in these children, and the outcome for, of these children with upward herniation, even after surgery, is very poor, with the mortal rate as high as 
Now, what are the advantages of PTP? It is a very simple procedure. It decreases the, it has been shown to decrease the incidence of post resection hydrocephalus. It's a, a, a faster operation than shunting. It prevents over drainage of CSF and therefore the complications like upward herniation, etc. But then, because as mentioned earlier, only 30% of children are going to have hydrocephalus following excision of the tumor, which means if you routinely do preoperative ETB, you are going to do ETB in 70% of children for whom it is not necessary. This is especially important because even though ETB is a simple procedure, it is not 100% safe as can be shown by the complication rate here. What about EBD? EBD provides the easy CSF diversion. It allows for continuous uh, intercanal pressure monitoring. It reduces the incidence of upward herniation. If it is performed during surgery, it helps in removing the blood clots and the surgical tapering. But the disadvantage is as mentioned by all the previous speakers, EBDs are naturally associated with the uh, infection rates. The longer EGP, the longer is the infection rate. An excellent study from Chitrakonal Trivandrum showed that the intraoperative use of EBD increases the chance of postoperative VP shunt by two and a half times. Now let's come to ventricular access device. There is not much of literature on the use of ventricular access device in post tumors. This particular study from China showed that when, when the perioperative period when OMIR reservoir is used, the no patient required a permanent CSF diversion in the postoperative period. And the infection rates as shown by this study are quite low, somewhere around 6.6 percent roughly. One study from once again from China compared two groups of patients, one with OMIR reservoir and one with uh, one group with preoperative VP shunt. And the, 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 these authors showed that the a significant decrease in complication rate when uh, ventricular access was used. Now we come to the next question. Is it possible to predict which patients with post tumors have a high risk of post resection hydrocephalus? Yes, it is possible to do that if because by using what is known as the Canadian preoperative prediction rule for hydrocephalus developed by Riva Cameron and colleagues. And this is the uh, score. It has a maximum score of 10. If the patient has a score of 4 or less, that such a child has a low, low, low risk of developing post-op hydrocephalus, whereas if the child has a score of 5 or more, there is a high risk of developing post-operative hydrocephalus. This score, of course, has been subsequently modified slightly. Now, we come to the important question. Why should 30% of patients develop hydrocephalus post-operatively despite re-establishment of the CSF pathway? There are many studies that can be referred to. I'll just refer to a couple of important st studies. These excellent studies by Spiros calculated the preoperative and post-operative ventricular volume in children with metalloblastomas. And they showed that all children in the post-operative period, period had, despite gross total tumor removal, had higher than normal ventricular volumes. And they suggested this is possibly a communicating hydrocephalus. And Nishima, way back 17 years ago, showed that, that it takes several weeks or even months for CSF circulation to become normal in children who are operated for post tumor tumors. Interestingly, an excellent study from Australia by Dr. Bateman and colleagues showed that we all remember the mandrocoli drop in when the intracranial pressure increases, the venous sinuses get compressed. Once the uh, intracranial pressure is decreased, the venous sinuses do not bounce back to their original normal size. Bateman and colleagues showed that it takes several weeks, several weeks for the, uh, the sinuses to come back to their original size and this is referred to as adaptation period. And that's the reason why a small proportion of children end up with post resection hydrocephalus. And there are several studies who have, which, which have now confirmed that post resection hydrocephalus is a communicating hydrocephalus. Now, let's come to the next topic, another interesting area. What's the success rate of preoperative ETB? Is it, does it correlate with tumor histology? There's one study which studied the, the, cor, uh, the correlation between success rates of ETB with the pathology. In this particular study, astrocytomas had a 100% success rate, whereas medullos had a very low success rate. We come to another interesting study, which uh, says, is it worthwhile to do a preoperative ETB in children with post tumors with METS at the time of presentation? This particular study showed that in children who have with post tumors with met metastasis at the time of presentation, the ETBs have a very high failure rate. In fact, these authors came to the conclusion Preferably, ETB should be awarded in this particular subset of patients. And how to manage patients due to the adaptation period? One possible uh, way, which is not commonly adopted nowadays, is to do a repeated LPs. If a repeated LPs increase the compliance of the subarachnoid space and that way reducing the outflow resistance from the, to the CSF from the ventricular system. 
on this is a study from Italy by Tamburni and colleagues who showed this who followed this particular management protocol. They did a perioperative EBD and their when their postoperative ICV monitoring showed increased ICP. They did a ETB and ETB fails. They did a shunt. But however, in their series, post resection ETB had a success it's rate as high as ninety percent. That's it. What about the long term durability of ETB vis a vis? Uh, ventricular body shunt in post sarcomas. If you look at the table on the right side, as expected, the complication rate is much higher in the in the shunt group, whereas the time to failure is there's a difference in time to failure. When EDBs fail, they tend to fail in the first two months, whereas V patients generally tend to take a longer time to fail. Now, what are the implications of the all the four five studies which I mentioned earlier? EDB has a fa higher failure rates in middle lobes. EDB has more than higher uh, 50% failure rates in mellows and ependermos in METS at the time of presentation. There is no difference in the long term durability of EDB, VCB, VP, VBS, and the EDB tends to fail earlier than VBS. And therefore, in a selected subgroup of patients with aggressive postiopausal tumors with uh, METS with, and those children with limited survival, it is prudent to do a VP patient EDB. So, what is the present state of art? What is the present thinking of management of vitreous surplus in postoperative tumors? There is absolutely no class one evidence. We do know that preoperative path, the hydro surplus at the time of presentation is obstructive. On the hydro surplus that exists after cross total tumor removal is a communicating hydro surplus. And the overall incidence of post resection hydro surplus is somewhere around 30 percent. Canadian preoperative prediction rule can identify the at risk group for hydro surplus, but it cannot tell us. Who are the uh, how to manage that uh, those patients and because thirty percent of the patients are likely to develop post resection hydro surplus, close clinical radiological follow up is required. And if there is hydro surplus post operatively, CSF diversion may be required. The choice is to the the addition of the surgeon. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mutho. It was a very comprehensive and a very informative uh, talk. And uh, I think uh, we will now uh, go ahead with Daljeet Singh's uh, lecture. It is about endoscopy in hydrocephalus. Daljeet, would you please go ahead? Yeah. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajshikhar, Dr. Dev Pujari, and everybody else. It's an really a feast to have uh, big names <clears throat> in one forum sitting together talking about endoscopy hydrocephalus i mean it's going to can you hear me yes yeah it's not moving what is the problem yeah sorry for that technical thing See, I feel no talks on uh, hydrocephalus uh, will be complete unless we acknowledge some of the known names who have done a lot of work in the treatment of hydrocephalus. This is Dr. Upadhyay. Many of you may have not seen his uh, picture before. Uh, he was the one who actually came out with the first shunt in India. He was from Ames. Subsequently, Dr. Chabra came out uh, with his shunt from uh, Lucknow. And uh, this is Harold Hopkin, who actually made a solid rod, rod lens system, which has uh, revolutionized the treatment of hydrocephalus by the endoscope. Many of you will not be familiar with this guy. This is uh, uh, Narendra Kapani, who is actually a father of uh, fiber optics. He was the one man who could called who was actually called as a man who could bend the light and because of his the all fibroscopes endoscopic system has evolved the legend all those who have worked in endoscopy in india and have published on hydrocephalus are almost each one of them you know them well these are the established names in the field of endoscopic uh, treatment of hydrocephalus some of them are emerging new stars as well in this field. Now, coming to the endoscopic options, uh, we have uh, primary treatment uh, with an endoscope, which could be the primary treatment of the etiology with the various options. 
and we can treat the underlying cause like for example neurocystic sulcus removal in some cases or colloid cyst resulting in hydrocephalus treat the primary endoscopic uh, removal and it is it settles down endoscopy can also work uh, for failed etv and also for failed ventricular peritoneal shunt we have rigid scope flexible scope fibroscopes now there is a era of 3d endoscope stereoscope and robotic assisted uh, scopes now what are the various endoscopic procedures i think this audience knows it very well they are etv but then this which still constitute about 90 to 95% of uh, endoscopic procedure but other things in armamentorium include equidectoplasty epidental stent septostomy monoplasty opening of the foramen of mesenteria lashka and choroid plexus fulgration with or without etv most of us are familiar with then we do use we have been using endoscopy for last two decades now and i think we have had uh, assemblies of all known gadgets and all standard etv which uh, has been previously shown uh, nothing much to add over there but then what we learned was that the failure of an etv primarily or even secondly is because of the persistent of a secondary membrane distally they can be two membrane they can be three membrane and why people miss out is that people tend to forget that the endoscope have a focal length of around 2.5 cm and in order to visualize beyond the etv site one will have to bring the scope into the focal length of the distal area to be able to see the distal obstruction in form of a membrane unless that is done it will result in the failure we have also learned what is a good etv and bad etv i mean uh, good etv we all know we can see the clivers we can see distal vessels and all flow of also but very often despite doing most of the procedure effectively we do land up into a situation like this where the margins hangs to each other they are likely to fail sooner or later not only that because the margins are hanging this happens when there is a very large third ventricle which is ballooned out and it floats during the procedure into the field tubercular hydrocephalus we have a granular uh, field which may be difficult to do as technically challenging but it is being done we may have obstruction at the aqueduct there can be hemorrhages and we also found some papillomatous growth which turned out to be tubercular so there are various mechanism which will a more important is that we started working on uh, aqueductal uh, procedures they can be a membrane in the beginning they can be a short segment stenosis in the aqueduct can be mid segment stenosis or can be very long segment which may be difficult to treat now one can see the membrane with a rigid endoscope one can open it and one can take the flexible endoscope deep inside to be able to see for a man of lashka and mesenteria and aqueductoplasty has to rely upon the opening of the uh, fourth ventricle precisely to be able to be successful what one can also learn is that in aqueduct stenotic there will be pre stenotic dilatation in certain areas and uh, one has to carefully negotiate the scope flexible endoscope through this sometime you may find ballooned out fourth ventricle in with the tonsillar herniation and that is because distal aqueducts uh, distal fourth ventricle is obstructed we have also seen tubercular obstruction into the aqueduct as well as in the outlet resulting in double compartment they can also be treated effectively quite often many of our resident do not uh, look into this picture this is a picture which suggests that the fourth ventricle outlet is obstructed you will find a picture like this fourth ventricle and alveolar and this is seen if the proper mri cuts have been taken up from those this helps you significantly if one is planning for aqueductoplasty whether it will work or not now coming to the list of the procedures this is a kind of a summary which has uh, been conducted now etv aqueductoplasty aqueductal stent septostomy monoplasty mesenteroplasty and choroidectomy flex uh, procedures one use flexible endoscope for aqueductoplasty rest all can be done with the rigid and of course mesenteroplasty and choroidectomy one will again fall back onto the flexible endoscope indications have already been uh, discussed etv can be done in most of the hydrocephalus for aqueductoplasty we believe that aqueductus nosis membrane with the short segment has a more useful application than other one stent 
can be put up in the short to medium segment stenosis. Uh, septostomy is used for multiseptate hydrocephalus, monoplastic for an asymmetrical hydrocephalus, magendoplasty for the blocked outlet, and uh, correct plexus fulguration. Often it is believed it because of uh, uh, will be useful in overproduction, although there can be debates on that. Limitations ETV and most of the endoscopic procedure would depend upon the normal absorption of the CSF from the brain, which we all know. Epidocoplasty, one can land up into false passages and uh, one can produce eye sign if it is not uh, carefully performed. Equiductor stents have been known to migrate if it has not been done. Septostomy only allows the communication between the various segments of the ventricular uh, septums. One will have to fall back to the basics of, uh, of flow of the CSF from system to outlet in order to be functional. And uh, monoplasty is technically challenging. Not many people have the experience of doing it. Correction would require lateral extensive uh, coagulation to be able to uh, get a result of further. It is said that more than 90% coagulation should be done bilaterally, which is technically very challenging. Success rate has been very variable. People have reported 40 to 100% depending upon etiology and age and uh, etiology is the main factor which de determines the success of uh, ETV. Uh, Equidectoplasty has said one has to have a patent fourth ventricular outlet to be able to have a successful procedure. Stent is technically challenging. Yeah, septostomy, where to make an opening into the septum also plays an important parameter because we, if you make an opening on the superior portion of the multiseptate hydrocephalus, it will it be less effective if you make an opening on the dependent portion. So these are the uh, procedures which are uh, done for, uh, for hydrocephalus using endoscope and I've tried to sum up uh, in a various uh, tabulated form. Now let us go and see the effect uh, and the response based upon various etiology. The some of the commonly used etiology, I think that we have already discussed, including now people are using for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Success rate is very variable. Various series have given uh, various results. As I've already been uh, said, intraventricular hemorrhage is 40 to 52 percent. The genetic hydrocephalus, neural tube defect is very less. Tumor hydrocephalus, I found, still has the maximum number, of, maximum chances of uh, uh, success rate than the rest of uh, the procedure. And then uh, um, there are a lot of list of complications. Technically, some of them are very challenging, and the audience, most of us are familiar with the techniques involved. Now, what are the factors which will result uh, in a good response after the ETV or most of the endoscopic procedure? As I said, age, generally more than two years would yield good results in most of the patient. Etiology has already been discussed, non-infective tumor and aqueductus stenosis primary would result better result. Technique is paramount. I mean, technically to be able to perform an anatomical third ventriculostomy and not being careful about the distal obstructions is still being seen very frequently, at least with the, those who are starting their procedure. It's technically difficult in intraventricular hemorrhages. Previous shunt, yes, it has uh, been said to be a risk factor, but then now people are coming up uh, to most of the endoscopists to remove the shunt and uh, replace it the ETV it is possible. So, Kulkarni had come up with a scoring system for the successful and I think beyond for me to discuss at short period of time. There's a huge list of uh, complications uh, which can happen, hemodynamic complications uh, during uh, the procedures. I have seen arrest happening during the ETV if it is over uh, inflated ventricular system which is transient and if you drain it out it responds. There's some amount of the bleeding which may happen and uh, major bleedings can uh, be catastrophic. So we know endoscopy can uh, uh, have a lot of advantage. time. Okay, sir. Sorry. It's already time. So uh, one, yeah, one minute, one minute more. Okay, so no shunt related problem, single incision, cosmetically better, short stay, more economical, minimally invasive, and it is done under visual control. You know, I think I'll conclude by saying we have uh, cases where uh, we thank we have endoscope with us because they can definitely make a significant change in the management of uh, hydrocephalus. Thank you so much. I'll conclude with that. Thank you.
Thank you, Darjit. Thank you very much. Uh, Lokendra, you want to take the discussion forward? Yeah, actually, uh, certainly I wanted to ask to Suresh Sankhla. He, he covered the topic very nicely, but something, whatever newer things are going on, for example, the general matrix bleeding uh, is very high rate in the very low birth weight uh, kids, you know, neonates. Now, if you yes. identify it beforehand, antenatal, or within mm. three days or within mm. 72 hours, we know about it. Now, some, you know, pharmacotherapy has been uh, advised. For mm. example, you can use corticosteroids uh, prenatally, antenatally. Postnatally, you can use intomethacin. Yes. What, what are your views about those things? Because they say that it is not the arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations, which mm. alone mm. are responsible for the CSF pathway, you know, to, for the completion. There's so many alternate pathways are there. So what, do you, what is your take on that? Uh, as far as the treatment is concerned, I think, you know, as you said so rightly, the best evidence so far we have got is the steroid therapy. In fact, if you give the, you know, uh, the mother prenatal steroid for whatever the reason, and then uh, you evaluate those kids, uh, you know, postnatal, uh, you will find a lot of difference uh, in the not only in the prenatal uh, stature of those kids, also the severity of uh, the uh, problems, uh, also the hemorrhages also are less likely and less severe. Uh, in fact, in one of the studies, it has been found that you know hemorrhages were very very less uh, in severity and the transformation of uh, IVH into PHS post hemorrhagic is is much much less. So the Steroid has certainly uh, got a very big role. Uh, not many other uh, medications have been tried. So many ethacranic acids and uh, so many other uh, medicines have been tried, but none uh, have given any concrete uh, evidence uh, as far as the prenatal treatment to prevent this complication is concerned. One, so, one more question, if I can ask very quickly, Raj Shekhar, if you allow me. Uh, uh, you see, we, we have uh, the iron which is there because in the grade two or grade three or grade four, even uh, mm -hmm. general general matrix hemorrhages when the blood is mm -hmm. the IVH is there simultaneously, mm -hmm. you know, grade mm -hmm. one, it is not there inside. Now this mm -hmm. iron is supposed to be very toxic to the uh, endothelial cells and the cilia, mm -hmm. which uh, are actually always, you know, floating in one direction and dragging the CSF downwards all the time. Uh, right. there's, a, there's, a, there's a hypothesis rather there's evidence that uh, mm -hmm. it the iron will damage these cells significantly and uh, these uh, movements ciliary movements are extremely important much more important than, than what we think probably do you think is there any role even if there's not a big hydrocephalus if there is a ivh present in these kids of uh, mm -hmm. lavazing the ventricle i'm just you see that just off the hook i'm asking off the cuff of course of, course. Role? of course yes yeah, yeah, of course, in my one of my slides is clearly shown that, uh, you know, evacuation of IVH, you know, or removing the, the blood from the CSF spread. Uh, you about Lavage. Evidence that it is, sorry? You mentioned about Lavage. Oh, no, I, I did. I, I mentioned about so many other other yeah. methods of removing the blood. Lavage is one of from, them. Okay. From the mechanical, from microthrombi formation or for, you know, physically uh, locking yeah, yeah. the duct or, or fourth once ventricle. Once you remove... Correct. I'm talking Correct. about iron point of view. That way. Yes. That's right. You, not only there are a lot of studies. You know, uh, I have not really covered all those studies because you know my main uh, uh, aim of this study was the you know post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and its management. Prevention was uh, you know not uh, very uh, much covered in this presentation. But yes, I think that's a very good uh, you know. Uh, uh, discussion on these things, and it's not only iron. There are several other blood degradation products which can, uh, you know, put lots of effect on the cell intraventricular ependyma and uh, uh, the whole uh, subarachnoid basal subarachnoid space. And if you remove those uh, the blood beforehand, you can prevent many of these uh, uh, to happen. Okay, many of the events to take place. So eventually, everything comes to the prevention of hydrocephalus. And I guess uh, it's very important thing. So before before I yeah I think there are a lot of questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, before I open that up, uh, I just have a few comments about uh, Muthukumar's uh, presentation. Uh, 
I think Muthukumar knows that we have discussed this before, so he knows these comments. Uh, but just for the audience, one is that we recently published our experience with post-tumor resection hydrocephalus for post first tumors in children. And the percentage was closer to 10% and not the traditionally quoted 30%. So it doesn't have to be 30%. If you radically excise these tumors, most often you can get away with a lower percentage. Secondly, we found a, 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 a unique risk factor which was not mentioned. And that is the presence of blood in the ventricles in the post-operative CT scan. That was an independent predictor of development of hydrocephalus. And that fits in with the theory of communicating hydrocephalus. So one way of reducing the incidence of post-operative hydrocephalus is to try and avoid blood getting into the ventricles, especially in the prone position. The blood will trickle down into the, the aqueduct, the third ventricle, and the lateral ventricle. And if you can plug the or uh, cover the aqueduct opening, with the gel foam or some other patties during the tumor resection and make sure that the blood doesn't get in, maybe you can have a lower incidence of uh, post-operative hydrocephalus. Uh, any comments, Muthu Kumar? Yes, thank you, Rajkir. Actually, there is a term for that particular uh, um, blood-induced uh, obstruction of the aqueduct that is known as snow globe effect. You know, the children used to play with the snow globe and they, they, when they shake it, the, the, uh, the, all these elements, flakes go up and then they settle down. So when you operate in the prone position, the blood goes into the, um, the third ventricle via the aqueduct. And then subsequently, post operatively at the uh, proximal end of the aqueduct, the blood settles and can, that can lead to, uh, certainly lead to obstructive hydrocephalus. That has been uh, reported, certain cases have been reported as no globe effect. And I certainly agree and I, I, I think I mentioned in the in the advantages of EVD, one of the advantages of intraoperative EVD clears away the blood if you have an intraoperative EVD. So, that whether that decreases the chance of post resection hydrocephalus, to the best of my knowledge, I don't have, uh, I don't remember there are any studies whether intraoperative EVD decreases the chance of uh, post resection hydrocephalus. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Shekhar, what do you want us to do? Take the questions in the chat or uh, you will read out the questions? I, I ask uh, one question to Muthu. Yes. Muthu, uh, I don't know how many people have done it or are doing it, but uh, I have been doing certainly earlier we used to do and off late also sometimes I do it, particularly post fossa tumors. After resection, you said that 30% patients still have hydrocephalus in spite of the resection of the tumor. Though you didn't really divide it into supratentorial and infratentorial. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking particularly about only posterior fossa tumors where you have to open the fourth ventricle uh, also sometimes. Or you can pass a stunt, a tube, which goes up to third ventricle and the other end you can put in the, um, you know, sister the magna. Is there any role of this? This is one question. Another is about the same. Patients having hydrocephalus, posterior fossa tumor, Beforehand, you put a vent, a occipital hole and you put a EVD there in prop, excise the tumor, then Torkelson procedure. I'm talking, you take it underneath the uh, you know scalp and then put that other uh, end into the cisterna magnet. Is there any role of these procedures nowadays or not? Rather than doing e ETV and V patient, can do you think do you emphasize that these can be useful? Now, I'll take the first question. The first question you mentioned about the passing a catheter through the aqueduct and then leaving it in the system of magna. My issue is as uh, even to, while talking about the aqueduct stenting, Talji did mention that it's very difficult for the to make sure that the stents remain there. My only issue is will the, the tube which you are going to pass, will it remain where it is supposed to remain? If it migrates, then can, that can lead to a problem. Number I'll two, tell you how it's done because I'm doing you is put it, you put put it put into third ventricle, other end, you stitch with the arachnoid of the cisterna magna. You stitch it, literally stitch it. No, I have not done it so far because I my only apprehension is the migration of the tube. My only apprehension is the migration of the tube. Talker system's procedure is yes, but then like any other shun, this also has a risk of obstruction, infection, etc. I don't yes, think we need to do that as a routine for all the post fossa tumors because the incidence, once you remove the tumor completely, is quite significantly less nowadays. Yeah. I think whenever it is required that we have equally better options. 
what do you say you are you are me you are referring to talk distance procedure no yeah. no no i am no, no. no, no. no, no. bengaluru no, no. i am talking about the placement as well as talk distance process uh there are questions uh, to almost all the speakers uh, venkat has a question that uh, what do you think about putting a reservoir at the time of uh, mmc repair and then converting into shunt as necessary i mean that is certainly an option but uh, we are not going to gain anything because we need to again do the repeated aspirations through the reservoir so instead i would prefer put a shunt if there is hydro surplus because invariably most of the children is going to have a progressive hydro surplus mm-hmm. if not in one weeks time within a less than 3 weeks so it is worthwhile putting a shunt rather than doing any interim procedures question you guys comment about um, Uh, shunting post um, meningitis uh, post um, cord patient with myelocytes see one we were um, we were initially putting in shunts into everybody as you know with like like venkat says if you had hydrocephalus and you have an open neural tube defects we were putting in shunts at the same time as repairing the open neural tube defects exactly what uh, venkat said we discovered that the incidence of shunt infection in these kids was definitely much higher as all the literature suggests we also found that there were one or two kids who who developed hydrocephalus and the parents refused a shunt and when we followed them up some of these children stabilized and didn't need a shunt so what we've done for the last i think almost 7 years now when we are just send this for publication is when we have a child with hydrocephalus i mean i'm not proposing this is what everybody does i'm just telling you what we found whenever we have a child with hydrocephalus and an open neural tube defects we repair the open neural tube defect and put in a ventricular subgalial shunt and then we watch these children we bring them back after 8 weeks if the shunt is still working and we see we as i said we percutaneously tie off the shunt and we see if they need a shunt or not and amazingly we found that about 34% of these children we could remove the shunt and didn't need a long term shunt which means we dis- we felt that we were unnecessarily doing shunts in open neural tube defects with hydrocephalus in almost a third of our patients this is exactly what ben warf uh, at harvard and uh, i think even at gosh now they are doing that uh, unless you have a definite documented uh, progressive hydrocephalus you wouldn't do a shunt and the general figure is about one third patients do not require shunt so the question of exactly alternative yeah, pathways yeah. and not only the uh, you know the only what they call bulk csf flow theory is uh, not the only one which we think is responsible for all obstructions so there are many ways that the csf is flowing in a non bulk way and adequate so open up and probably we do not require shunt in those patients uh the other questions are on what is the best shunt tube rajesh babu asks from coimbatore who is going to take that question i think christian sant rose has answered that question <laughs> many years ago by saying the best shunt tube is not to have a shunt tube uh, well i i don't think answer to... is the one which uh, does not produce any complication is the best shunt tube whatever is familiar to you whatever is working based in your hands so because there is no trial which has shown superiority of a shunt over the others and in fact uh, benwarf's uh, paper had shown that uh, from all the pressure shunts and uh, pressure adjustable shunts he found that chabra shunt was equally good so i i really don't know unless the panel thinks otherwise i am happy to listen the other question is about the yes. etiology of normal pressure hydrocephalus i don't think we took that up today but if somebody wants to talk briefly about it in children you mean well normal pressure heart rate uh, i really do not think uh, we are talking children we are talking of uh, adult generally the typical syndrome which we have not really taken up today so beyond the scope of today's webinar i would say uh can i ask a question to sandeep is it allowed yeah yeah please okay please. sandeep please. Uh, we mostly talk in terms of uh, you know tubercular or non tubercular bacterial uh hydrocephalus uh, what about uh, viral hydrocephalus the reason is reason why i am asking the latest i was reading uh, you know a paper about 
from they published in Dr. Kuo from uh, in, in Nature that uh, viral hydrocephalus, the etiopathogenesis is totally different because uh, there is a there is a virus affects actually the production of you know Fox one. It's a it's an agent in the uh, endothelial cells and which is necessary for the movement of cilia and they put a lot of stress on cilia. within two hours actually they stop working and if you uh, replenish it they start functioning. Now that's why I'm asking the part are two questions. The two parts are there that how frequently you see viral hydrocephalus and how do you identify really? And is there any scope for this latest in future? I mean, say because the talk should cover everything. That's why yeah. just for completion. To be completely honest, I can't say I have a great deal of experience on viral hydrocephalus. I have read the literature. I know that the H3N2 type A influenza virus causing hydrocephalus has been reported in literature. And uh, I am uh, actually, I have complete ignorance about that article in Nature. But uh, the, I personally would have no great experience of operating on children with post viral hydrocephalus because most of these children that we see uh, with uh, hydrocephalus do not have a viral uh, infection as an etiology by and large. So I don't know, I'm not qualified to comment. Maybe somebody who has experience on dealing with. A uh, large number of post -hi uh, viral hydrocephalus. Yeah, the, vi the viral etiology can be classified into two groups. One of those is the congenital ones, where earlier we have been doing all the cytomegalovirus, etc. Yeah, so those are the entities where there is a definite uh, proof that viral uh, etiology for the hydrocephalus. In the postnatal life, uh, when it comes to that, many of the encephalitis, 10% of the hydrocephalus has been reported. Uh, that is etiology is, is a virus is the cause as a virus related parenchymal damage is the cause of the hydrocephalus is still uh, not very sure. So there are theories proposed that it is an ependymal infection which result in hydrocephalus and a viral infection causing the arachnoidal damage, arachnoidal villi damage causing the communicating hydrocephalus has been proposed. But there has been no proof so far in the postnatal life that it is a viral induced hydrocephalus altogether. But However, the management doesn't differ if there is an active progressive hydrocephalus, it requires treatment in the usual conventional way. Same holds for the fungal hydrocephalus as well. Uh, I think uh, there is a question about prophylactic tapping after uh, MMC repairs. Uh, any suggestions on that? Uh, uh, that's why I gave the three options. Sandeep, when I said this uh, simultaneous repair is already, we have a proven progressive hydrocephalus. In that situation, you put a shunt and also repair the uh, uh, myelomeningocele together as a best. I advantage. agree completely. Yeah. When there is a doubt, I don't think that is an option we have. We can always repair the myelomeningocele and wait. And when you wait, we have the easiest option is the neurosonology to progressively look at that. And if the hydrocephalus is progressive, I mean, you have the, you have the option of doing a sub uh, galial shunt or a ventricular access device for a while if you think it is going to get stabilized over a period of time. But a very small percentage, probably we don't have a, uh, probably you are telling the 30% of them is a good number. Uh, but majority of them, in my experience, have progressed to a, a hydrocephalus, which uh, need, deserves treatment. Now, one of the problems is that some of the hydrocephaluses apparently look that they have stabilized, but invariably if you look at their uh, uh, neuropsychological outcomes and the neurological deteriorations, secondary to syrinx as well as the worsening of the tethering syndrome has been described. So we need to weigh between whether we really take the balance. It's not the treatment of hydrocephalus alone, which helps the recovery of the cortical mantle. It has also has in indirect influence on the syrinx as well as the worsening of the neurological deficit related to the myelomanics. So these and are the... Yeah. So if I may just say, Venkat, I agree, I agree completely with you. My, my problem was, whenever I thought, I'm going to watch, is this hydrocephalus increasing in size or not, my meningomyelocele repair would leak CSF. Yeah, exactly. The ventricles would that become smaller in size, yeah. and then I had the nightmare of CSF coming out of the spine and ventricles which are small in size. So exactly. this was the problem of waiting and watching. And the other side, if we did a shunt, was we were we were uh, making these children be destined to have a shunt for their life, for the rest of their lives. 
So this is why we thought a compromise formula was doing this VSG. And then when we looked at our figures and found 30%, and Richard Haywood from Great Ormond Street did the same, and their figures were exactly the same. 30% they felt was unnecessary. And Rick Abbott, uh, in a letter, though he's not published this, has said exactly the same from New York. So then we felt that perhaps one of the compromises is do a temporary procedure and watch if they stabilize. Because the nightmare I've had is of, of seeing, let's wait to see if this hydrocephalus progresses. And it progresses with the CSF coming out of the wound and you have small ventricles and then you don't even, can't even put in a shunt and them happy. There is a question for Danjit. It is worthwhile watching the overall outcome of these children in comparison to the other group. That's it. Danjit, there is a question yes. for you. Yeah. About hyperkalemia after ETV, why does it happen, and how oh. often does it have you seen it? See, I Hyper seen it. hyperkalemia after ETV in pediatric hydrocephalus. Yeah, yeah, I have seen in some patients uh, who have uh, possibly have been given infusion of Ringer lactate has some amount of the potassium in that, and in certain children, over infusion with the Ringer lactate. Uh, I mean. So constant observation. So our anesthetist is very careful in these patients while we are giving infusion with the ringer lactate. So this has potassium, we have to be watchful. So possibly, I mean, these are the, some group of uh, patients who develop hyperkalemia. Second hypothesis related to that has been, maybe there has been a pre-existing ad adrenal deficiency in these patients, which tend to manifest more when you have done ATV in some kind of an hypothalamic dysfunctions, which these patients uh, can also be prone to. So, I mean, these are the two hypotheses. So, you know, in those cases, our anesthetist definitely takes up the immediately post uh, uh, arterial line is put almost in all the patients. I mean, this is a practice in our institution. And we do monitor the potassium to decide other things. If it is there, we have to uh, do some kind of a diluting the ringer lactate uh, um, during the procedure if it is so, or if it is a pre-existing hyperkalemia in this patient. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mutukumar there? Yes, I am Malai's question. I'm, I'm, that's yes. regarding Is Malai's it necessary question. to put an additional shunt? Can you answer that question? Please? I think uh, if, if you if you have done a gross total resection, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, maximum rate is somewhere around 30 percent only. So 70 percent of patients will not require. So as I think I mentioned in one of the concluding slides, so we have to be aware that uh, hydrocephalus can develop post, post resection even after cross total resection. If and when it develops, then we have to treat it according to the method, serious of diversion according to the method of your choice. It's not a, a must that you should do it uh, in every case. If and when it develops, then we have to treat it. Sandeep? Yeah. Sandeep? Yeah. Is Sandeep there? Yes. Uh, uh, Sandeep, there is a question from uh, Prashant in Nagpur who wants to you to briefly explain the VSG procedure as he has not seen it being done. Okay, um, I had a, had a slide which I uh, very quickly went through. So what you do is you, when we exactly. do these infants, we make a small incision in the lateral angle of the fontanelle. I do not actually make a, a hole in the bone at all. I go through the lateral angle of the fontanelle. Remember, it's a temporary procedure. Put the ventricular catheter into the ventricle like you would for a frontal horn and a shunt and connect it with a low pressure valve. And then the peritoneal catheter we chop off, make a small little tube, which is distal to the valve. I try and put the valve over a part of the bone so you can, you can press it rather than over the soft fontanelle. And then what I do is make three or four holes proximal to the distal opening of that uh, peritoneal catheter, which has been chopped off. And if you really want to know how I make the holes, I find the best way to make side holes is using a bone nibbler. So I use a small bone nibbler, I, I, uh, I twist, I uh, angulate the shunt valve and chop off the side and it makes nice, lovely holes on the sides. And then we make a big subgalial pocket with a small little incision. So you have a, you sweep your artery forceps from the frontal bone right back to the temporal occipital area, make a big subgalial pocket and put it in. It, it's very simple. As I said, it takes a few minutes to do. Sure. Thank you. There's a question Sandeep. to... Yeah. Sandeep, Sorry, can, can I ask something? This question to uh, Daljit again. Yes, sir. Uh, about uh, mechanism of subdural hygroma in post ETV. In okay, yeah. Have no. you? Sorry. So I didn't hear you. Can I come in? Sir, SK Gupta has asked this question from Chandigarh. 
no no from agra. Is is an sk gupta yeah. from agra uh, from agra agra okay <laughs> common name <laughs> common name <laughs> yes go ahead then. anyways important question hey, i mean there are uh, there are two possible things one is there is no absorption of the csf is happening from this uh, brain and then there is a collection one second possibility is that suddenly there is an excessive amount of the csf which is started coming into the subdural spaces or subdural spaces beyond the normal absorption capacity of a particular individual unfortunately there is no non invasive method which is known to pre operatively preempt what whether the absorption in these patient is existing or not and if so what is the magnitude of absorption in these patients so collection is in if the larger is the ventricle more amount of the csf is going to be diverted from the ventricular system to the subdural spaces it is bound to remain there poor is the absorption poor is the rate of the absorption or not no absorption is going to be there it's very common and it, it is more often seen if it is being done in the children of less than Six month of an age. That is what been our observation. That is the cause of the failure in the doctor the Dev Pujari. Any additional also, thing you like to add? Daljit, Daljit. Also, you know the CSF CSF coming out from the track through the track. Yeah, more volume of the more volume of the. Can I make a comment? Using the pediatric scopes, we started with the OE scope, and now we are using what is called little lota scope. I think the. percentage of uh, subdural hygromas has reduced and uh, if i have done a satisfactory third ventriculostomy i do not leave a catheter or i actually try to close the shunt tract uh, the the uh, cortisectomy cortisectomy side oh cortisectomy yeah with so that has helped but uh, i think uh, if you have not been happy with your stoma if you have kept a uh, uh, you know catheter Uh, through your endoscopy tract then of course it is possible we deal with it by doing a lumbar puncture daily for the next 3 days uh, some people are doing and many patients settle with that but it is about 50 to 60% settle yeah. uh, another 30 to 40% you have to really re examine if your stoma has been adequate or not and maybe consider an alternative procedure if it is adequate no we have a reservation of putting any additional thing because you know i feel that potency of the ostomy would be pressure gra uh, gradient generated if you put two tubes and draining out one to another the pressure gradient across the floor of the third ventricle gets a compromise and this ostomy is going to close so uh, i mean uh, i have never practiced uh, that in my life dr venkat can i close can i ostomy uh, with uh, gel foam as well as fibrin glue I think that seems okay. Yes. Fair enough. That's a good suggestion. I also do the same thing. Right. Placing a yeah. catheter certainly precipitates the incidence of subdural hygromas. Okay. Yes. Can, can I ask a question to the experts on EKV about this? Because in my experience, the majority of the subdural hygromas that develop after EKV are totally asymptomatic and don't need any treatment. What percentage of children with these subdural hygromas have you seen that require any intervention at all? Yeah, I agree with you. You know, because it is more of an image uh, uh, scare, post-operative image scare, which is happening, and I have uh, uh, also started leaving them. They gradually settle down over a period of four to six months. I agree with you. I agree. But, but I think these are children who are victims the, of the famous. It's not the subdural hygroma which bothers so much. It is the CSF leak if it starts from the wall. Yes, yes, I that agree. That's all. Sandeep, can I ask you one question, which is uh, in your talk? Uh, was not very much highlighted and questions are also not there so i want to ask about it one of the dreaded complication of um, you know post infective hydrocephalus multiloculated hydrocephalus which remains to be a progressive disease actually now is there any is there anything new how to stop the progression and what can be is there any better manage, method of management of multiloculated hydrocephalus a progressive problem Uh, answer to your question is there anything new i am not aware of anything new to treat it how i would treat it i showed you a post infective hydrocephalus what we would do is initially if they are multi loculated is to put in an endoscope try and break the loculi put in a ventricular subgalial shunt again i know you're getting tired of my using that uh, procedure but it it works well leave the ventricular subgalial treat the infection come back again break more loculi if you have to and then if you think that you need you can try an etv you try an etv if it doesn't work you put in a vp shunt but not 
not until you have broken the locula as far as possible and temporized. As I said, you have to also drain the CSF because if you have stagnant CSF, no antibiotics are not will cure that infection. So VSG allows you to drain the CSF and wait while you cure the infection. We'd go back. If we can do any TB, we would try any TB. If it's not easy, then I would do a BP shot. Do you, do you give an inject, uh, antibiotics through the tube? I have injected almost every antibiotic available uh, that can be injected intrathecally. And uh, our own conclusion is it really doesn't make a great deal of difference. Mm -hmm. And today I do not put intrathecal antibiotics. And I put in everything starting with uh, gentamicin uh, two decades ago to colistin. More recently, there are articles that describe intrathecal colistin. In our experience, it has not made a great deal of difference. Okay. So, so very, very, can I ask a question? Is a meta-analysis available of uh, intra-ventricular uh, and intrathecal use of uh, cholestin as well as uh, uh, I think aminoglycosides? And what it seems very peculiar is that the results are worse. And one of the main reasons is you are probably putting them in hopeless cases anyway. So it is not really matched controls where you are using intraventricular or uh, intrathecal uh, versus uh, giving only systemic. So it's a really very and the doses. Yeah. Answer. One of the mechanisms. The Can I ask a question? There yeah. is a significant amount of ependymal tears and damage. Mm -hmm. Whatever antibiotic you are giving, it is seeping into the parenchyma. It is supposed to increase the further neuronal damage. That's the reason. And not only the outcomes, including the psychological outcomes, are very, very worse in these children. Absolutely. Sandeep, can I ask you a question, please? Sandeep? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. So, uh, when the uh, subgallial pocket is full and ends, you tap the pocket or you tap the shunt reservoir? You're muted, Sandeep. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, if the subgallial no, pocket is full, and this in our experience occurs only in about 25% of these kids, the smaller they are, the less the mm -hmm. chance of this happening, then we would tap the subgallial pocket, and I also actually tap the valve. So that um, the idea being that you sort of reduce the amount of CSF that will flow into that pocket for some time. But we definitely have needed to do this in less than 25% of kids. Mm -hmm. Have you done this in adults? VSG? No, no, not in adults. Anybody, anybody in the panel has used it in adults? I have done in the 15 year old boy. 15 year old boy. I have done in one 20 year old boy when nothing else worked. Yeah. I mean, we've I used it in our children up to about seven, eight. I have no experience of using it in adults, but I, I think it would probably work as a temporizing measure. I guess so. I guess so. Because there is a precedence for it when you do, uh, you know, subperiosteal drainage of chronic cerebral hematoma. So, so there is a precedence. So when it can suck, absorb the blood, obviously it should absorb the CSF. It can absorb the CSF. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the things which came up while uh, Raj Shekhar and Muthu Kumar were discussing was use of EVD and would it increase the uh, uh, chances of post-resection uh, 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 hydrocephalus? I decrease. think this question is answered. Decrease. Decrease. Yeah. Decrease. Yeah. yeah. Decrease. So, uh, it has uh, uh, been uh, uh, one of the papers where it has been tried to be answered is uh, Tamburini's paper who has actually shown that uh, use of EVD has, they have found that the hydrocephalus rate had actually increased. Uh, there was okay. uh, surprisingly higher incidence of hydrocephalus in patients where EVDs were used. Mm -hmm. And I think that was because uh, probably the surgeons suspected that these are the likely patients who are likely to develop mm -hmm. hydrocephalus. So some of these things get a little biased. Uh, Sudipta from Dhaka has a question for uh, uh, Dr. Daljit Singh. Uh, do you prefer uh, uh, flexible scope for uh, ventricular lavage or do you do it with a rigid scope? Oh, lavage, lavage. Uh, we, we use only the rigid one. Flexible I'm using only for negotiating from third ventricle to fourth ventricle. Aqueduct and uh, I have removed some neurosuchy surfaces no. also from the fourth ventricle using uh, flexible scopes. But then for lavage, I think uh, it's always been rigid. Yeah, yeah. Lavage, lavage always. So I think, uh, uh, 
gentlemen uh, we are coming to the close of our today's program and i would Thank like uh, one comment from each of the uh, speakers and panelists before we finally close so start with uh, i'll start i'll start okay <laughs> the post year for that room was where i just take that we can cannulate uh, you know retrograde from fourth ventricle to third ventricle we can put a, a tube atul goel has actually described this in british i have done in around 30 35 patients in my whole career not many but <laughs> I, i am quite satisfied with that wherever you feel that it might get blocked you know the, the hydrocephalus when total excision is not possible brain stem you know in the fourth ventricle tumor is there you feel lot of blood is there you feel that there will be obstruction of uh, uh, you know foramen majendi and lushke yeah in those cases i have always put it i have never repented actually it can, it doesn't migrate because i have always stitch it All with right. the arachnoid great uh dr uh, sankla uh, i think i would uh, like to say few words about the lavage now you know not it, it helps in the hemorrhagic situations but uh, recently we have found that even in severe infections in the infants with uh, severe uh, infections where the antibiotics are difficult to, to uh, really manage the infection uh, we have done the lavage and in one of the patients who had a fungal infection the ventricle lavage really has made a, a very good difference uh, uh, in the outcome and the requirement of the antifungal management and all these things so uh, i think that's a very good uh, option in many cases and should be considered uh, whenever it is possible uh, dr venkat Uh, i feel uh, hydrocephalus still lot more need to be understood about uh, both in the congenital hydrocephalus as well as in the spina bifida uh, one thing i would say is that is something is a condition which cannot be taken light and uh, hydrocephalus i would be little aggressive in treating so do we have burnt fingers We're looking at the size of the ventricles the dynamics in each individual patient is totally different though we cannot come at a generalized guideline that this is the algorithm one need to follow but one need to be very watchful about each individual's progression of the hydrocephalus and try to be very aggressive and the timely treatment and the right treatment is the only way we can rescue these things dr chatterjee i'll also talk about lavage in fact uh, we have tried lavage you know when initially i think there was a question to suresh about lavage in post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus we did try it and then just when we were about to start doing it the result of the drift study came and as you know the drift study the ethical committee stopped the study after 6 months because the incidence of secondary hemorrhage was so much that they didn't continue it however these authors followed these children up for 2 years 3 years and actually wrote another paper saying that at 2 years the cognitive uh performance of these children that had had a lavage was better than the control group even though the study had been closed or stopped because of ethical reasons and, and also very, the results of the shunt in those that subgroup was very much much better than the normal yes, yes and very very recently uh my friend ulrich tomale uh, from germany has published their experience as you know with uh, with uh, lavage in post infective hydrocephalus and they were able to show that they reduced the incidence of subsequent permanent ventricular peritoneal shunt by as much as 50% though they don't have a control group but they compared with historical controls and that was very interesting that's actually published in uh, uh, in uh, neurochirurgy and it, it's worth a read it, it was published only a couple of years ago sorry it was published 2000, in 2014 2000 in world neurochirurgy 2014 was probably in no, no it was in 2018 in fact uh, andeep uh, he still has a study open yes open, yes, yes. Yes. yes anybody is interested in lavage mm-hmm. you can just follow his protocol and report your cases to him they will be taken into a large analytical yeah. uh, basis yeah. it was in world neurosurgery in 2018 i, I can tell yes muthu kumar sir <laughs> i have a comment about this uh, Our, your comment regarding uh, leaving a catheter or a ventricular access device in children with uh, ETB yes. who undergo ETB. I mean, in the I think at least a decade and a half earlier, when ETB became very popular, some of the British neurosurgeons and probably others would have also seen reported some cases of sudden deterioration or even sudden death 
we have to do something it. in the emergency which uh, i mean there is no time for the neurosurgeon to intervene following some of these unfortunate incidents some british neurosurgeons started using ventricular access device leaving ventricular access device now what is i mean that is something that uh, the, the treating surgeon and especially the parent should also be aware that sudden deterioration can occur in children who undergo edb because we do not know why the stoma suddenly closes and the uh, icp rises something that should be uh, taken into consideration while counseling the parents james james drake actually wrote up a small series of it. we we had our patient who, which we reported in neurology india the problem is you don't know which patients because both my patients who had something like this were congenital aqueduct stenosis and we had no doubt and this happened more than a year and a half after the event so i mean most of the stoma closures we say that occur very quickly so yes i i tend to leave it more liberally than uh, a ventricular access device more liberally especially in children uh, oh, final really word by dr raj shekhar uh, just one uh, aspect of uh, management of post infectious hydrocephalus which we use which has not been talked about is called the long tunnel evd we bring out the shunt tube from the abdominal end where we usually put in the shunt into the peritoneal cavity we bring it out there and we have been able to keep these uh, brains for up to 6 weeks while the infection is being treated or sometimes post hemorrhagic we have tried some etv or some other reason there's blood in the csf you can't do a shunt a regular vp shunt we have done this long tunnel evd and we have had a pretty good success with this so this is one other option in addition to the vsg that sandeep is talking about and this can be done even in adults uh, i mean it definitely does work in adults and so the problem is occlusion problem is occlusion you know longer no, the tube no, no long tunnel evd for us has worked wonders it's not a problem we take it under general anesthesia of course you have to take the patient to the or if you are doing it for the first, means if there is no shunt in place then you have to do it just like a vp shunt except that you don't put the tube into the peritoneal cavity you bring it out and a closed device and the whole system is closed and uh, you treat with antibiotics repeatedly sample the csf to make sure that you know the infection is getting controlled and once it's controlled you can internalize the shunt so this is just one more option to keep in mind we have just published this for neurosurgery no i i think it was quite popular actually uh, uh, and it it seems to reduce the infection rate as well so many right. people do it for uh, in fact i remember a patient a pediatric surgeon colleague of mine actually came to me uh, one day and said that i have a child who is on evd for several days and i want you to convert it into a etv can you do it and i said okay let's go and see the patient he says no patient is right besides me he had brought him to the outpatient department <laughs> walking with <laughs> so and the bag was uh, in his uh, literally in his hand so yes it 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 can work well if the patient knows how to take care if the family knows how to take care as opposed to no uh, we, we, we don't know. our patients were admitted by the way no we never like we were not so adventurous we oh, didn't yes. leave the, let these patients go home <laughs> this child we didn't let these patients go home <laughs> we have used uh, up to the neck is there an advantage yes. taking it down yeah, further longer yes yeah. yeah. so when cut the the longer the distance between the cranial end and where you bring it out the less the okay. chances of infection okay thank you gentlemen uh deep and more say something can i can i say a few words just one word Yes yes can i can i can I? yeah, yeah please. Uh, this is actually nothing to do with this symposium this is this is um, about uh, the 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 survey that uh, uh, we have recently opened on behalf of the indian society for pediatric neurosurgery on the practice of uh, shunt infection shunt and shunt infections so we have tried to send the link to all the members and all that those who have not fulfilled the filled up the uh, survey please test as possible this is just a step of uh, uh, some uh, attempt to make some guidelines on the uh, shunt uh, sepsis and its management that's fine thank you thank you very much thank you sorry i missed out in between there was a connection problem no i think uh, we are good uh, uh, deepak uh, thank you and uh, thanks all the panelists and thanks all the participants for active participation 
I am sorry if some questions have not been answered, uh, but uh, maybe there will be another occasion. Thank you very much. Sir, on behalf of uh, Health and you, we would like to thank Dev Pujari, sir. Uh, sir, what a phenomenal star cast uh, you had today. The popularity of the speakers and the uh, discussion panel have attracted 983 doctors for this webinar from eight countries. Uh, I was waiting till the last night when I crossed 1,000. Uh, <laughs> so 983 doctors have logged in uh, for your discussion. That shows your popularity. That shows your following among uh, fellow uh, neurosurgeons. So I would like to thank, sir. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to carry this webinar on hydrocephalus. Dr. Deep Pujari, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suresh Sankla. Thank you, Dr. Venkat Ramana. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muthu Kumar. And thank you very much, Dr. Daljit Singh, our speakers, and our panel members, Dr. Rajshekar and Dr. Uh, Lokendra Singh. What I like the most is the question that are asked by the speaker to speaker, and uh, the, the willingness to answer and go deeper into a problem. I think this was a true sharing of knowledge that happened between peers uh, with, the, with the leading neurosurgeons of the country. Uh, I, I like the atmosphere in which it was uh, uh, conducted by Dr. Deep Pujari, sir. So thank you very much. Uh, Health and you request you to support our products. And uh, thank you for taking care of uh, patients in this COVID-19 uh, uh, days. Uh, this is Deepak Naik signing on behalf of Health and you. Uh, thank you very much, audience. You must have found this session extremely interesting and uh, uh, very, very enlightening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Health and you always together with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So nice. Thank you.